you want to know about laser beams, Mortimer? said Arabelle. Ah, said Mortimer. As far as he was concerned, Arabelle might as well have asked him if he wanted to know about the exports of methylated spirit from Westphalia. Mortimer wasn't in the least interested in laser beams. All he wanted to do was to annoy the horse, Katie Daly, so much that she would break into a gallop. The Jones family were travelling through Ireland in a caravan, being pulled by Katie Daly, on their way to visit great aunt Rosie Ryan. Now, where, you may ask, was Mr Jones' taxi? Well, it had developed clutch trouble as they reached a little town called Ballyshoe. A new clutch had been ordered, but it was going to take five days since it had to be fetched from the other side of the country. Now, while this was being discussed, Arabelle had noticed a whole row of horse-drawn caravans standing in the main square of Ballyshoe, waiting to be hired. Oh, please, Pa, can't we go in one of those? she begged. I always wanted to live in a caravan, so has Mortimer, haven't you, Mortimer? Ah! And it would be much better than waiting here for a week while the taxi's fixed. We could go on and see Great Aunt Rosie and come back and pick up the taxi afterwards, couldn't we, Ma? Well, that's ever such a sensible idea, really, Ben, said Mrs Jones. And it would be ever so romantic, travelling in one of them gypsified wagonettes. A real Romanesque holiday. Oh, very well, very well, grumbled Mr Jones. But it's against my better judgement, mind. Those things only go about two miles an hour. And who's going to look after the horse, may I ask? You don't just pour oil and petrol into a horse. You've got to brush them and comb them and curry them and I don't know what all. Well, I dare say it's ever so easy, really, said Mrs Jones. They'll tell us all about the curry at the hiring office. Probably give you a big box of it there, like those do-it-yourself curry kits they've got in the windows of Indian grocers. I'll do the brushing, said Arabelle eagerly. I'd like to do it. Supposing its shoes need changing, said Mr Jones. Arabelle was surprised. Must horses get their feet wet, she said. Well, no, but sometimes they drop their shoes in the road. Oh, well, Mortimer will keep a lookout for that, won't you, Mortimer? Ark, said Mortimer. So, here the Joneses were, travelling at two miles an hour towards Great Aunt Rosie and Castle Coffee. They had phoned her and said that they might be a few days later than expected. At present, their road lay across a huge brown bog, which was called Black Fecal's Bog. As far as the eye could see, there was nothing but flatness and brownness. Arabelle had wanted to come this way because she'd heard that there was a dinosaur's footprint on a small hill right in the middle of the bog. And she'd always wanted to see a dinosaur's footprint. But now even Arabelle was getting a little bored with the brown view. She was reading aloud to Mortimer out of the children's encyclopedia. Mortimer wasn't listening. Mrs Jones was taking a nap inside the caravan. And Mr Jones was leading the horse, Katie Daly, along the road. Yes, I knew it would work out like this, he muttered from time to time. This place is as flat as the perishing Siberian desert and as cold. And it was cold. Arabelle was wearing two sweaters. Mortimer had his feathers all puffed out. And people they met along the road said it was the coldest summer since the French had landed in Ireland, and that was over 190 years ago. Laser beams are made of light, Mortimer, Arabelle continued. Scientists have managed to squeeze a whole slab of light together into a thin stick like a knitting needle, and it's so sharp it can cut through steel or sew up people's eyes if they have holes in them. Yeah, I wish we had a laser beam, said Mr Jones. Maybe we could use it to fry up a few chips and onions. I'm sick to death of baked beans. Well, just at that moment, Mortimer, whose sight was very keen, noticed something in the far distance and let out a croak. What is it, Mortimer? said Arabelle. Can you see a dinosaur? Never more! And he began to struggle in Arabelle's arms and finally jumped down into the road and flapped off sideways across the blackish-brown spongy peat. Now, watch it, Mortimer, called Mr Jones. You sink into that bog, nobody's going to pull you out, and I mean that, I am not risking my neck for no raven. Mortimer, please come back, called Arabelle anxiously. But Mortimer went on walking across the bog. He never flew if he could help it. So Arabelle jumped down from the caravan steps and went after him. Arabelle, Mr Jones shouted crossly, where the blazes do you think you're going? But look, Pa, there is something over there, a dinosaur or something, flapping about, carrying on. Well, I'm sure I hope it isn't one of those bog people, said Mr Jones, who was now making his own way onto the bog after his daughter and the raven. I wish to goodness we've never come this godforsaken way, that I do. Anyway, I'll bring the driving whip along. I can always use the handle to punch whatever it is on the snout. Arabelle, Mortimer, will you come back out of there? No, Pa, listen, said Arabelle. I can hear somebody calling help, help. Maybe it's one of those leprechauns they're always on about. But then he began to hear the voice calling, help, help. Bless my soul. 
If it isn't some silly bloke, what's got stuck in the bog? But what in the world did he go out there for? I mean, that's what I'd like to know. He must be dicked in the knob. Don't you go get in too close to him now, Arabelle Ducky. You can feel it's getting quite unreliable underfoot. I think it's a man pie. He must be right up to his waist in the bog. Why don't you throw him the end of your whip and then we'll pull him out by the handle? Well, this seemed a good suggestion to Mr Jones. The whip was a long leather thong fastened to a thick, strong wooden handle. So, standing on the firmest bit of ground he could find, Mr Jones hurled the thong of his whip forward like a fisherman casting a line. But the bitter cold wind was blowing so strongly from the other direction it kept blowing the thong back to him again. Oh, dang it. Oh, plague, take the perishing thing, muttered Mr Jones. Now what's to do? Arabelle, will you come back out of that goo? You're up to your knees already. What will your ma say when she sees you? I don't know. <coughs> shouted the man in the bog. He seemed to have mud in his mouth. Then Arabelle had another good idea. Mortimer, could you very kindly take the end of the whiplash in your beak and fly with it over to that person in the bog? She spoke as persuadingly as she knew how. Normally, Mortimer was the last bird in the world to do anybody a favour. He wasn't in the least interested in other people's troubles. But fortunately, just now, he happened to be quite curious about the black, thrashing creature in the bog. So, after thinking about it a long minute or two, he opened his beak, jammed the end of the whipcord into it, shut his beak again, and set off in a slow, reluctant, grumbling manner to fly the twelve feet or so across the bog. Well, when he was directly over the stuck person, he began to hover on his wings like a hawk, and he dropped the end of the line. Oh, well done, Mortimer, called Arabelle, very pleased indeed that Mortimer had felt inclined to help. Well, the muddy person grabbed the line, and Mr Jones began to pull on the whip handle with all his strength. But for a while, it seemed quite hopeless, like trying to drag up a cast-iron manhole cover with a spider's web. Arabelle went to help her father. She, too, seized hold of the whip handle and began to tug and strain. Nothing happened at all. Mortimer, flying round and round above the person in the bog, now decided to take a hand, or rather, a claw. Swooping down, he seized a clawful of something, snatched a beakful of the bogged person, all he could see sticking out of the mud, and then gave a mighty flap upwards, shouting, Never more! at the top of his voice. There was an equally loud yell from the person in the bog, and a tremendous explosion of mud and froth and peaty water. Keep on pulling, dearie, shouted Mr Jones. He gave another powerful jerk on the whip handle. Now the person on the other end of the line came right out of the bog with a loud, sucking, squelching slop and began crawling and sliding towards Arabelle and Mr Jones as they hauled on the line. Mortimer, mad with excitement, was flapping over the person's head, making grabs at his hair and his collar and his ears, hindering, in fact, rather more than he helped. They heard a frantic shout. Will, will you be getting that godforsaken bird off of me before he has the eyes out of me head entirely? Mortimer, panted Arabelle, I think you'd better come back to us. Mortimer seemed quite unwilling to do so. He was really interested in the rescue operation by this time. But luckily, next minute, they'd managed to drag the bog-fast person onto a piece of ground that was firm enough for him to stand upright, and he did so. Now they could see that it was a man though he was covered with dark brown, treacly goo from head to foot. Ah! said Mortimer, very disgusted indeed to find that it was only a human they'd rescued and not a dinosaur. He was so annoyed that he shrugged his wings and began walking slowly and sulkily back to the caravan, kicking away bits of peaty soil with his rear toes at every step. Be gara, said the man they'd rescued. Yeah, you saved me life between you, but I'm thinking it may have been at the cost of my ears. Yon carrion crow, or whatever he is, he's got them notched like postage stamps. Still, I'm not complaining. I'd have been a goner. I'm greatly obliged to the pair of you. What in the name of nonsense were you doing out there in the bog? Oh, well, you see, I'm an entomologist in my spare time. That's a bug hunter to you, Akushla, said the man to Arabelle. And I'd heard tell of a colony of the large pink butterfly out on Fecal's bog. Oh, very rare, the large pink is now almost extinct. So, seeing the bog's uncommonly dry this season, I thought I'd try me luck. And did you see any? inquired Arabelle, greatly interested. Well, I had a glimpse of some Milana, I believe, but they were a great way off yet. It's a shame I couldn't get closer to them before I began to sink. As they began to pick their way with care back towards the caravan, Mrs Jones came to its door, having been woken up out of her nap by Mortimer's annoyed croaking and flapping up above her on the roof. But when she looked out, she saw three black figures approaching out of the bog. 
for Mr. Jones and Arabelle had also been fairly smothered in mud during the course of the rescue. And immediately, Mrs. Jones let out a large screech. Ah! Merciful cat's alive! Murder! It's three gypsy mummies come out of the bog to cut our throats! Help! Help! It's Black Fecal himself, risen from his watery tomb, or Black Treacle, and he's brought two of his fiendish lepidopters along with him. Help! Help, Ben! Arabelle, where are you? It's all right, Ma, it's us, called Arabelle reassuringly. We pulled a man out of the bog. He's not a gypsy mummy. His name is Mr Plunkett. For on the walk back to the road, the rescued man had told Mr. Jones that when not chasing butterflies, he was a respectable factory owner and lived not far off in the port of Glasshaven. Oh, my poor palpitating heart. Oh, how do you ever expect to get all that washed off? Tell me that. I mean, there's only one little pink basin in the caravan, no bigger than a salad bowl. I can't shut my eyes for five minutes. You're into some mischief, Arabelle Jones, and your father's just as bad. I don't know. It's enough to give a body the historical fantods just to look at you. Oh, I believe I feel one of my spasms coming on. Ah, no, let you be easy, ma'am, said Mr Plunkett kindly. You must all come back to Glasshaven with me and have a grand wash-up at my place now. I've two bathrooms and all the hot water in the world, and my housekeeper will be after making a bundle of your muddy things and taking them round to the laundrette. Sure, it's as clean as mushrooms. Your husband and daughter will be in no time at all, missus. And I invite you all to stay and have dinner in my house tonight, and I'll be showing you around my factory. Well, this seemed like a friendly, hospitable plan, but Mr Jones inquired cautiously, uh, how far will it be to Glasshaven, Mr Plunkett? Our glory be, is nothing of a distance at all, 20 miles, if that, and me own car parked a step of the way along the road. I, I could be taking the lady in it if she wishes. 20 miles, said Mr Jones. Katie Daly won't do that in two days. But to his amazement, Mr Plunkett got hold of the reins and snapped them briskly along Katie Daly's back and shouted, Mush her now, will you? in such a commanding tone that Katie instantly set off at a gallop, almost before Mr Jones and Arabelle had time to scramble on board the caravan. Mortimer enjoyed the breakneck pace very much and yelled with pleasure and excitement, jumping up and down a great many times on one of the well-sprung bunks. Ah, yonder's the dinosaur's footprint, called Mr Plunkett, as they dashed past a little hill in the middle of the bog. On one of its sloping rocky sides could plainly be seen a set of marks like those made by six enormous toes. I wish I could see a dinosaur, Arabelle sighed wistfully. Look, Mortimer, here's a picture of one in my encyclopedia. It's 80 feet long and weighed 50 tonnes. Yes, you have one of those for your Sunday dinner. You'll be eating shepherd's pie for weeks, said Mrs Jones. Now they came to Mr Plunkett's car. Well, Mr Jones was fairly sure he would never be able to persuade Katie Daly to gallop, so he got into the car and drove that, while Mr Plunkett continued to act as coachman for the caravan. In not much more than an hour, they'd crossed a row of grassy hills and could see the sea ahead of them. Soon, they reached a small harbour town. Ah, glory be to goodness, Mr Plunkett exclaimed. Isn't that an iceberg drifting towards the shore? Or am I not to be believing the evidence of my own two eyes? True, it is the coldest summer since the French landed, but I never did see an iceberg so close to land at this season of the year. However, it was quite evident that he could believe the evidence of his eyes and that it was an iceberg. It floated about a mile out to sea, a great green mountain of ice. And a whole lot of people from Glasshaven were crowded on the grassy cliffs and harbour side, watching it with great admiration. Oh, well, I hear you are not much now. Do you ever see the lake? They were all saying. Look, Mortimer, just look. Never more, said Mortimer, wonderingly. He'd never seen an iceberg in his life, nor, for that matter, had Arabelle. And nobody had ever seen an iceberg like this one before as you will find out tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>